vineyard. And so after here, you will see some uh, some of that. And I think every Thursday and Tuesday, you get a test of how God is doing in that direction. Without a doubt, uh, Bernard has been one of the most respected scholars in South Africa over several decades, whether in theology, church, academic, theological, church, academic, or public circles. And so um, he is a very, very well respected uh, person in those various uh, respects. And I would like to welcome Bernard to come and introduce our speaker this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, it is a privilege to introduce our speaker. Uh, Professor Zebdi, have you heard, is described by, by his peers as one of the leading historians of Ethiopian history. And it is a rare privilege to have him here, not as a presenter, but also as a fellow. Uh, he's uh, the find, uh, one of the founding members of the Ethiopian Academy of Sciences, of the African Academy of Sciences. As you heard, he's the Emeritus Professor of History of the University of Addis Ababa. But he served academia also much wider than his own institution and his own discipline. Uh, worked in Kodestria and Osteria. He was uh, editor of many journals and projects and uh, amongst other things 14 years of the editor of the African Review of Books. So he has a really wide spectrum mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in many, many ways. Mm -hmm. He has been invited as a fellow to mm -hmm. uh, all over the world uh, to important research institutions. He taught at many universities and he is uh, everywhere regarded uh, with, high, uh, with, high, with high esteem for the work that he is doing. He's the real polyglot, you know, uh, Arabic, um, um, Italian, German, French, English, and now his own language, of course. Uh, so uh, his spectrum and his abilities is really wide indeed. He's published widely, as you can read from the uh, the introduction to the seminar, and I don't need to repeat all the publications, but uh, he is very well known for his um, standard book, The History of Modern Ethiopia, in the second edition already, but uh, for many, many other ways and publications that he cooperated. Now, as I said, he is, he is considered to be perhaps the well, I would venture to say the leading authority today on the history of Ethiopia, a very interesting, ancient, um, complex region with a long history, often with surprising and dramatic turns in that history. And what makes his work so interesting and, and compelling is that he you is know, not only a narrator of events, but he's really interested in the intellectual uh, frameworks and ideas behind these which propel and in many ways steer these events. He was a fellow of STIAS in 2018 and we're very happy to have had him here to work on the project uh, with Manuel Castells, what eventually became the, this book, The National Identity and State Formation in Africa, where the, the question was exactly with the new rise of national identities all over the world, how does that impact on the way states organize and manage themselves, and especially in Africa, where there is this high level of diversity and mobility. And what he made clear in his chapter, and I would urge you to read that, is exactly how um, patterns of thinking, uh, concepts in themselves have a direct impact on how events evolve. And the, his focus was on identity to show that the, the type of identity or the way we think about identity has consequences for how we, we manage uh, 
not only ourselves, but also state relationships and, and, and relations inside and outside the country. And he made clear how identity itself not being, uh, itself being a mobile and flexible concept can be both destructive and, or constructive. It can be constructive in a medium way if the ability to develop a, a, a um, multi-identity comes to the fore, but it can be very destructive if it's, if it's conceptualized as a mono-identity. I'm sure that is what he'll be speaking also to us uh, this afternoon. So it gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce our speaker. And now I've, now I've lost the topic, but you will <laughs> announce it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Largao, for this uh, lavish introduction. Uh, I think this lecture, in a way, is a culmination of uh, an association that I started with SAS, SAS in 2018, when I was invited by him and uh, Professor Manuel Castells for a conference on uh, issues of identity in Africa. Uh, uh, and I thank him for that invitation. And so that, that conference that Christoph actually approached me and suggested whether I should, whether I would like to apply for fellowship. And that's how, uh, after some Christian terms, thanks to COVID, I'm finally here as a fellow. And I would like to thank Stairs for uh, the generous uh, hospitality, uh, my own really, leadership, administrative staff, the kitchen staff. Above all, uh, and uh, and the libraries, the university library staff, who have been really supportive of my uh, research. Uh, uh, and I would like to begin by giving you some background, beginning with subject-specific bio. Uh, I've been grappling with this issue of identity in Ethiopia, in particular, and in Africa in general. For the past, you may say, 20 years. Uh, my first uh, paper or chapter was written in 2005. It was prepared actually for the 20th International Congress of Historical Sciences, which was held in Sydney, Australia. <coughs> Thanks to visa complications, I couldn't attend, but uh, one of my colleagues, my Nigerian colleague, Asiwaju, presented it there. And eventually, the African panel, the papers of that African panel, were published in a special issue of Rita Zamani, uh, which is the Journal of the Association of African Historians. Then in 2007, uh, in my capacity as, as, as the vice president of the Association of African Historians, I convened a conference in Addis Ababa uh, under the theme of society, state, and identity in African history. Uh, I did it in collaboration, of course, with the institutions, uh, with the Forum for Social Studies, which I was heading, and my own Department of History at the Sabe University. Something like nearly 70 papers were presented at that conference, and the selected 21 or two were uh, finally edited by me and came out in a book form. This is the second uh, picture image that you see. In 2014, uh, my long-awaited book on the Ethiopian student movement, on which I've been working for something like a decade and a half, came out, The Quest for Socialist Utopia. Sometimes it is confused with Ethiopia, but it is Ethiopia. <laughs> and, it's, and, and one whole chapter, chapter six of that, is dedicated to the question of nationalities, which was one of the, the cardinal points that was raised by the student movement. I think there were two major points that were raised in the 60s and 70s. The first was land to the tiller, essentially changing the old feudal relations. And the second was the question of nationalities. Uh, and both of them actually were to have long-standing long -standing, uh, implications. The land to the tiller question was answered in 1975 
by the military regime <coughs> with the proclamation of one of the most revolutionary land reform proclamations. The question of nationalities and the solution that the students uh, came up with uh, after a long debate, actually, it was, it was a very protracted and somewhat acrimonious debate. Finally, of course, they resolved, the students resolved in 1971 in parallel congresses in Europe and America and the US to recognize the principle of self-determination up to and including cessation. That principle was eventually adopted by the NPRDF regime, which came to power in 1991, and which was enshrined in the 1994-95 constitution, federal constitution, which is still operating. So uh, that's why I devoted one entire chapter to address this question of how it came and what, how it was uh, finally resolved. And finally, of course, uh, uh, as I referred in uh, 2018, I was invited to present a paper on the question of Eritrea cessation for Ethiopia, and uh, that became uh, a chapter of the book that uh, Professor Lacan just just mentioned. Uh, sorry, uh, and then also, since this is an audience, uh, non Ethiopian audience largely, I think I have to give some some facts. Uh, I don't, I won't, I won't budge for the 100% accuracy of these figures. I present them only. Uh, just to give you an idea of the distribution of population among the different regions or ethnic groups. Like, as you can see, uh, I don't know if, if you can, uh, you see the Amara, the third on the line, about 20 million. Then further down, the Oromo, Oromia region, 33 million. And then uh, Southern Nations, National and Peoples region, this is quite a mouthful, which is, which is actually a conglomeration of different ethnic groups. Uh, uh, and that's about 11 million. Between them, the three of them actually have constitute about 70 or 80 percent of the population. And at the very end, you have the Tigran region, which is about five, five million. So this gives you a rough idea of the, of the population size of the different regions. But this is not 100 percent accurate, but essentially, I think it is. And then some landmarks in modern Ethiopian history, which are very important to really uh, uh, understand all these developments. 1896, the famous Battle of Adwa, when Emperor Menelik defeated the Italians and Ethiopia was saved from being colonized. This is one of the most distinctive features of Ethiopia and most of the things, most of the, the way the country developed, the trajectory that it took, has a lot to do with the fact that it was not colonized like the rest of Africa. And, uh, it, it, this is a landmark event, one of the most important events. 1974 was the, the Ethiopian Revolution, which did away with a monarchy that was Emperor Haile Selassie uh, uh, ruled for something, he had ruled for something like uh, 40 or 50 years, from, effectively from 1916 to 1974. So uh, almost 60 years, you may say. Uh, as first as heir to the throne, after 1930 as emperor. So that, of course, was led, essentially spearheaded by the students that I mentioned earlier, uh, but of course, eventually, no it took over, and we had a military regime from 1974 to 19, a Marxist military regime from 1974 to 1991. Uh, 1991 is again the overthrow of the Dirk and the coming of the EPRDF. I will say a bit more about these acronyms later on. Uh, and the APRDF, which, is, which was led by the Tigrayan group, TPLF, the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front, was in power until 2018 when Abiy came to power. He was a child of the APRDF, but at the same time, he was a nemesis of the APRDF, so to say. Uh, although there are some continuities between the APRDF and the party, the prosperity party that he has, uh, has launched. So these are landmark events that are very important to keep in mind when we discuss most of these uh, issues. Acronyms. Ethiopia has been called the land of 13 months of sunshine because we have a different calendar as you know. We have 13 months each of uh, 12 months of 30 days each and a final mini month of five or six days. Uh, so it has been called 13 months of sunshine. That was the tourism law basically. Nowadays it has changed into the land of uh, origins because of the human origins, Lucy, and all the rest. You can, it, might, it might as well be called the land of acronyms, you know. If there is one country <laughs> that has so many acronyms, it is 
it is Ethiopia. I, I cannot imagine. I have not come across anywhere, any other country. And most of the acronyms end with LA for F, Liberation Front, Front, and so on and so forth. Uh, and essentially, that shows you how violent uh, the recent history of Ethiopia has been, how contentious uh, it has been. Uh, and these are still things that have not been resolved. Uh, so essentially, my lecture would have the following outline. Outline: I would say first a few things about the global reality of uh, identity, uh, ethnicity versus national identity. Uh, say a few, few words about the literature on the on the subject, and finally focus on the Ethiopian reality, Ethiopian case, which as I put in my abstract, for the sake of simplicity, would we'll just categorize into three. This is antithesis and synthesis. The question mark after synthesis is, of course, for the purpose. It's, <laughs> it is meant to say that it's still something that has to, uh, to be worked out. Uh, while I can, I can speak with confidence about the two, uh, I cannot speak with confidence about, I wish I could, but of course it is something that we probably have all to ponder and discuss. It is a global reality. Identity is a global reality. The tension between mono identity and multiple identity between the ethnic group and the nation. Uh, it is something that has been with us, with, his, with uh, humanity, you may say, for a long time. It is often hotly contested, hotly contested subject. There are many examples. I'm just mentioning some random, um, random examples here. Ireland, as you all know, the Irish question has been there, although now it seems to have been relatively uh, resolved it has been there for quite a long time. When I was a student in London uh, doing my postgraduate studies, uh, whenever I went out of out of my my home, my my room, my room, my only my all, worry, worry always said, would I come back in one piece because of these bombs, Irish bombs, you know, the, the whole in the seventh. I'm talking about the seventh. It's just in case you're wondering, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, every day there were some bombing incidents and so on. So it was really uh, quite clear that there was something wrong. The Balkans, everybody knows about Yugoslavia, which is not Slovakia, which has been split into two, and, and so on. And in Spain, you have Catalonia and the Basque region. Uh, and in Africa, we have had our share of contested identity in Cameroon, between the Anglo and Francophone. Nigeria, which of course had the bloodiest, one of the bloodiest civil wars in Africa, the Afra uh, civil war. And Rwanda, of course we saw this genocide of uh, 1994. South Africa had its own problems, but although it has probably succeeded more than many countries in trying to resolve the question of identity. So the challenge is really how do you temper this ethnic or mono identity with multiple identity, with national identity. Uh, and uh, multiple identities are so pervasive. They are, they are there every day. We have examples of multiple identity. I, so I, I chose this image, not because I'm a tennis fan. Yes, I am, but, mm -hmm. uh, but essentially for me, as I was watching these teenagers fighting for the US Open final, women's final, I was really struck more than by their being teenagers, by their being completely unseated. You know, in fact, the, the, the champion actually was a qualifier. And she eventually she she, she won the, the 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 tournament without dropping a set. That was what interested what interested me was when I looked at their background, at their origins. It's amazing, you know, the the, the winner on the on the on the, the British Emma, she is born of Chinese father, mother and a Romanian father. Uh, the loser, but also, of course, really the finalist, the other finalist, was born of a Filipina Canadian mother and Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian uh, father. Uh, so we have this kind of multiple identities. Uh, uh, and we have, to, how do we accommodate them? This is really a challenge uh, that uh, we face in Ethiopia and, uh, as well as in the world. So the, when coming to the literature, it's a very, it's very vast. You know, the question of identity, the question of ethnicity has been treated by so many uh, uh, authors. And one of the benefits of my coming here 
essentially to really into this past decision, thanks to the uh, university library service. Uh, and I'm still not through with it. Uh, essentially, you can divide them into the primordialists and the instrumentalists. The primordialists are those who think that, who believe that ethnic identity is there. It's a given, it's eternal, it has been there forever. It's a fixed thing. Whereas the instrumentalists are those who argue that actually it is something that is created later on and is also possible subject to uh, liable to to manipulation. Uh, but on the on the on the first uh, in the first category, you have this Walker Corner, who who I found essentially really almost reifying ethnic or ethnic identity to the extent of saying that nations, ethnic groups are nations. The other nations, the ones that we call nations, are not nations, but they are states or countries. So it's probably a very extreme position. On the other hand, we have the critics of uh, 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 ethnic identity uh, and the implications, uh, destructive, destructive possibilities of uh, exaggerated ethnic uh, identity. Amartya um, Sen wrote a, a brilliant book on how identity is related to violence from his experience in India in 1947, when uh, the, the Hindus turned against the Muslims, the Muslims turned against the Hindus, and people were being killed just because they happened to be on the wrong, in the wrong uh, ethnic group, because it happened to Hindus. In fact, they had a very uh, quite uh, uh, unsettling experience as a child when uh, he saw a Muslim being attacked by Hindu fanatics. Uh, Terence Ranger, mm -hmm. uh, he's a historian of Africa, mostly working on Zimbabwe, uh, was built in Oxford, and he had a book on the invasion of tradition, how the colonial intervention actually invented tribes, went around inventing tribes when they were, when they were, they were not uh, existent. Uh, and uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, of course, has been a critic of the colonial intervention uh, in terms of really creating new identities and so on. Probably Rwanda is uh, the best personification, the best example, illustration of how colonial intervention actually invented tribes because uh, the Tutsi and the Hutu were not ethnic groups before the Belgian scale. They were just social categories. They spoke the same language. They, they lived probably side by side, uh, along with a small minority, the Tua. Uh, but when the Belgians came, they categorized them into two ethnic groups, different ethnic groups, and they were given ID cards. And eventually, of course, the ID card became uh, the, their, their, their dome. Because in 1994, it was on the base of ID cards that the Tutsi were selectively uh, liquidated. So, uh, uh, Ethiopian case, I would say, would be closer, I mean, in terms of the study of ethnicity, would be closer to uh, okay, yeah, I think it's okay. Someone else started to share as well. It's okay. It's a journey, I guess. <laughs> Someone else started sharing. Lovely. Okay. Is this where you are? Yeah, that's good. I would argue that the Ethiopian case is closer to the instrumentalist view of ethnicity rather than the primordialist view, because as you will see, uh, as you proceed, it is something that is actually quite recent. Uh, the idea that the ethnic ethnos is more important than nation or country is something that's quite recent in Ethiopian history. The speaker is muted. The speaker is muted. Okay. 
Okay. So Ethiopia is uh, okay. Let me show. Give me some kind of problem. Okay. Yeah. So if you if you, if you feel baffled by what's going on in Ethiopia, don't lose heart because we ourselves, Ethiopians, let <laughs> alone the commoners, even the academics, don't fully understand really what 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 is going what's going on. So that's why, in the interest of simplicity, I, as as I said, I said uh, I discussed the thesis, which is of course a pan-Ethiopian or national, whichever way you look at it, identity, and the antithesis, which is a more recent uh, evolution. The, we have something like uh, maybe 70 years old or at most 50 years, maybe uh, 60 years, ethno-nationalist identity. And finally, of course, some tentative suggestions about what kind of, what possible synthesis could there be out of this. So this is, of course, uh, the first point to make about the thesis is the longevity and continuity of the Ethiopian state. And this is uh, why I said, you know, Ethiopian identity should have been a given, and not for everybody. So how can we, there be a problem of identity in Ethiopia? Because it has been known. Um, if you stretch it too long, you'd say it has 3,000 years of history, the story of Solomon and Sheba, although historians are uh, a bit uh, cautious about starting Ethiopian history there. <laughs> But it had definitely 2,000 years of Is the speaker is muted again? Speaker muted again. We can we cannot hear the speaker. He's muted. Sorry. No worries. Yeah. So Anamara would identify himself by region. Are they going to uh, or even as a Shewe, or, Lo, or Woloye, for instance. Uh, but even then, in fact, within, the, within that region as well, there was a sub kind of sub regional identity. If you take, for instance, uh, Shaw, the Shaw Amara, who say, I'm from Bulga, from Mans. In fact, sometimes some authors actually, when they write books, they say, so and so from the nation of Bulga. Bulga would be a very small. Uh, district within the Amara region. So this was this was the kind of identity. With Oromo, the, likewise, we have the Leka Oromo, the Sibu Oromo, the Borana, the RC, but there was really no pan Oromo identity. Except, of course, uh, the Oromo usually do trace them, their, their origin back to a common father. That's only uh, a common identity that they have. Otherwise, in terms of organization, in terms of administrative structure, they were divided into different uh, groups. And uh, thirdly, there was 
very high level of ethnic interaction, including ethnic intermarriages at both the elite and the popular levels. Uh, the, in fact, the, this arranging ethnic, inter-ethnic marriages, inter-dynastic marriages was really a, a pastime of the members of the ruling class to cement the power of the of the of the of the center. And there are there are examples uh, uh, in if you in the central highlands, the Salari, for instance, was supposed to be Oromo, but actually uh, the, it's very difficult to make the distinction between the, the Oromo and the Amhara within the Salali group. One of the most famous thing, singers uh, uh, in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s was a man called Ababa Tasama, who was equally mesmerizing, captivating when he sang uh, Amhara and Oromo, Oromo songs. Uh, when you come to the Sordo Gurage, the Gurage are supposed to be a Semitic class, they a Semitic group, but the Northern Gurage are very much closely uh, interconnected with the Oromo to the extent of uh, even taking the name Sodo, which is actually an Oromo, Oromo name. Uh, and then if you look at the names of the Sodo Gurage, also they are partly uh, uh, Oromo, sometimes partly Gurage. So there, was, there has been this uh, continuous interaction and intermarriage uh, in, in, in among, among the different ethnic groups. And then when you come to the real class, you could say in many ways, although the Amara were generally dominant, it was a kind of poly-ethnic ruling class. Uh, the Tigrayans had their share, uh, as I will come later on. The Oromo, after they came to the Central Highlands in the 17th century, were very much part of the northern uh, political structure, but either as uh, very important, powerful officer, officials of the kings, or at some stage, for something like uh, uh, 60 years, actually establishing their own dynasty, which was known as the Yeju dynasty, which controlled the central power. The emperor was there, but he was, he was just a figure. It was really the Oromo dynasty that was uh, in control uh, on behalf of, of the king. So this is a general picture. And another theme is, of course, the, the way Ethiopians rallied uh, as Ethiopians in times of external, external threat. We have seen Adwa, March 1896, uh, defining, defining, even defining not only for Ethiopia because it guaranteed its independence, but also defining for Africa and the rest of the black world uh, because it was an inspirational event. Uh, the beginning of Pan-Africanism is also associated with, with, with Adwa. Uh, if you look at the flag also, we will come to the flag later on, the Ethiopian tricolor, uh, green, yellow, red, actually is duplicated throughout much of Africa, particularly Western Africa, from Senegal all the way to uh, Benin. Uh, so uh, I think I counted something like uh, eight or nine national flags in Western Africa, in West Africa, which actually adopted the Ethiopian tricolor. So this was this was a moment when Ethiopians rallied and fought as one to stop the Italians from uh, occupying Ethiopia, including the recently incorporated uh, regions of the southern part of Ethiopia, including the Tigrayan ruling class, which had been for a short time actually kind of being uh, the, the, being wooed. It was wooed by the by the Italians to defect to their side, but eventually at the, at the critical hour, of course, they came over to Minilik and Ethiopia fought as one. Well. Then uh, 1936 to 41, the fascist uh, Italians managed to avenge their defeat at Adwa in 1896 and uh, were victorious for a short while and managed to occupy uh, the country for five years. Uh, but so short-lived precisely because again, the people rallied to fight against the Italian occupation, confining them essentially to the to the cities and the towns. Uh, and uh, it was this corrosive effect of the resistance of the Italians, sub aided by the British, who actually finally uh, moved against the Italians because they were dangerous for their colonies, that eventually um, uh, forced the Italians to evacuate not only Ethiopia but also Eritrea, which they had occupied for a longer period of time. Then 1977, uh, Siad Barre 
think, thinking that this was the best time uh, to attack Ethiopia because it was in the source of source of uh, revolution following the 1974 revolution. He attacked, and of course, he was also repulsed by uh, the United uh, uh, resist Resistance or uh, United Defense of the Ethiopian Forces, of course, supported as well by the Soviets and uh, the, the Cubans. And then the final chapter, uh, I think, would be Badrme, which is a war between Eritrea and Ethiopia in 1998-2000. A uh, kind of border war, but it has many other dimensions as well. But then again, to the surprise of the EPRF, because they thought that Ethiopian nationalism is no longer uh, there, but uh, they have done enough to to minimize or to undermine Ethiopian nationalism or Ethiopian patriotism. Actually, the people responded as one to repel the, the Eritrean incursion and finally achieve the victory. So these are the, uh, some of the achievements. Just, just to illustrate the point, some Ethiopian uh, icons, national icons, who really show that the Ethiopian identity was really seen as paramount as compared to ethnic identity. These are what we call Oromo national icons. I put the Oromo in quotation marks because not some of them, as you would expect, are not full Oromo. They are mixed, mixed parentage, which of course who isn't of mixed parentage <laughs> in Ethiopia in particular. So we have uh, Fitarari Haptagurgis, uh, his Oromo, was an Oromo father and a Gurage mother, uh, the anchor of Ethiopian statehood in the beginning of the 20th century after Emperor Menelik was incapacitated and could not really control the thing. And in the, inter in the interval between the death of Menelik and the coming to power of Philo Selassie, he was the anchor person. Uh, uh, he, uh, for whom Ethiopia was the most important thing and the legacy of Menelik was the most important thing. And uh, I was actually so impressed by his uh, achievements. Actually, I wrote a biography of his, uh, 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 of his career, or his life and career, uh, which came out in 2016 uh, in Amharic, no, not, not in, in English. Then next to him we see uh, uh, clockwise, going clockwise, Abba Bikila. I think some of you at least know this name. He was, he was pro the, the first African Olympic gold winner, uh, the first Ameri African marathon winner, and not only to win it once, but also twice. And the person who was able to win the first marathon in Rome in 1960, which is symbolic actually, in 1960, running barefoot. So he was a legend actually. He's probably the greatest distance runner of all times. An Oromo, but essentially considered himself an Ethiopian. And going next to him, Loret Tsagai Goramadin, one of an Oromo uh, father and uh, Amara mother. Uh, the Port Laureate, the person who more than anybody else revolutionized American uh, Amharic, Amharic versification, uh, uh, as well as a great Pan Africanist, a friend of, uh, friend of Senghor and uh, Shekhan Tadeo, uh, and he completely changed the, 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 the scenery when it came to Amharic. Uh, versification and as well as playwright. Play you know, the playwright translated translated uh, Shakespeare's works uh, or Otello, <coughs> Hamlet, as well as of course writing his own his own plays as well. And uh, Talaon Gassas, of course, was the king of pop, the king of Ethiopian pop, who dominated the pop scene for in the 1960s and in the 1970s. Uh, and they remained or uh, Ethiopian even at a time when uh, Oromo nationalism was getting, getting ascendancy in, in many parts of Ethiopia. The matter of fact, Sagai, the Lord Sagai Garamadun died fighting not only the, the kidney problem that he had as uh, dialysis, he was also fighting ethnicity, ethnicity, ethnic nationalism or ethnic nationalism while he was uh, in exile in, in New York. We have also Tigrayan national icons like Emperor Johannes uh, the Fourth, who reigned from 1872 to 1889, uh, just before Menelik, and he was famous. He was regarded as, as a national hero, as a religious hero as well, 
He defeated the Egyptian forces twice in 1875, in succession actually, and 1876, because in Kedi Ismail, the ruler of uh, uh, Egypt, was trying to control the whole of the Nile. So it's, it's a kind of a foreplay of uh, the current the current crisis that we have, the Gerd crisis. So they were defeated twice. What's, what's very interesting is actually uh, in the second war, in 1876, the Egyptians had also the, the benefit of being commanded by veterans of the American Civil War, Confederate generals who had come over from the Civil War and were leading the Egyptian troops. They were defeated twice. And of course, he died a martyr fighting against the Sudanese Mahdists in 1889. Next to him, we have Nagadra's government by Kadai. The, the years 1886 to 1919 is not the reign, but it is actually his lifespan. So 30 years. But in 30 years, he did something phenomenal. He's probably one of my, my personal heroes. He is the centerpiece of my book on the pioneers of change in Ethiopia in the early 20th century. Uh, prolific mind, very incisive, incisive mind. He wrote two works. He had two works, one short but very powerful, where he really analyzed critically the Ethiopian situation uh, in, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century. And the second one is actually a bigger book, this kind of political economy of Ethiopia at that time. So uh, essentially all of this were really fighting or writing as Ethiopians. And then of course the Amara national icons uh, as well. Uh, again, of course, there you have this parentage. Uh, so sometimes in the case of Theodros, I think it's probably was full blooded Amara. He is a founder of, he's generally regarded as the, the founder of modern Ethiopia. He, the first who introduced the idea of uh, modernization and unification in the middle of the 19th century. Menelik, of course, on the right, was the most famous probably, uh, born of an Amara mother and a palace servant who may have been actually uh, an Oromo. And Emperor Anus Lassie, born of an Amara father, and uh, I think in his, father, in his mother's side, he had also Oromo as well as Gorake, apparently. Uh, they are well, well known, so I don't really have to dwell into their, their careers. And of course, uh, to make it a bit spicy, <laughs> we have also what we may call culinary unity. <laughs> the money, what you want to do in the real sense of that was tomato. <laughs> it is anything but tomato. That's really highly carnivorous. <laughs> uh, that's called kutfo, which is, uh, to call it steak tartare is really an insult. <laughs> <laughs> It's something like steak se tartar, but it's highly spiced and highly buttered. Uh, it was a gurage, essentially at the beginning it was a gurage specialty. Now it has become one of the most popular national dishes with a side dish, of course, of cabbage, curry, and uh, cheese. And on the right side, you have uh, ambasha, which was originally a Tigrayan bread, but now has become a national bread. So, how does uh, how do how does the counter narrative start? Where does it start? Why does it start? Uh, essentially, I think it is a narrative of oppression that all this unity and uh, Ethiopian identity was based on the oppression of marginal groups like the Oromo, the Southern peoples. And the marginalization of the Tigrayans in particular. I think the Tigrayans, after the, the death of Emperor Yohannes, felt kind of marginalized. So, this is the genesis. Uh, there, there, there is quite a lot of truth in, in this, both the oppression and the marginalization, but I think it has been kind of exaggerated, uh, hyperbolic, basically, to the extent of the colonial thesis, you know, some, especially Oromo, taking their cue from the Eritreans, you know have actually advanced that this relationship between the center and Oromo has been a colonial relationship, that the, Oromo, the Oromo have been colonized by the Amara. So, which is of course not quite a tenable uh, thesis, but they are pushed in uh, with a view to uh, argue or campaign for Oromia independ independence of Oromia. Oromo nationalism started with a kind of rather innocuously with the self-help association in the 1960s. Uh, uh, fortunately, of course, the, the government at the same time had its problems, it could not accommodate it. Uh, and finally, of course, it uh, took a radical turn 
and the 1970s was converted into the Oromo Liberation Front. Tigrayan nationalism could be said to have started in 1943, the first report, the southeastern part of Tigray. It was in 1975 that uh, uh, Tigray students, university students, actually organized or created the Tigray People's Liberation Front and began fighting the government from 1975 until they became victorious in 1991. I think we have to be very clear here that so, not all Tigrayan students who subscribe to the ideology or the program of the TPLF. Quite a large number of Tigrayan students, radicals, you may say, but some of the most famous radicals were actually uh, fighting uh, in a multi, multi ethnic, multi ethnic Ethiopian political leftist organization called the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Party. So, when it comes to Eritrea, of course, uh, uh, it's a long story. I mean, it's, uh, it started with a uh, until until the Italians colonized it uh, and created Eritrea. Actually, Eritrea was the name that uh, the Italians created for the northern part of Ethiopia when they finally colonized it in 1990. Uh, but from 1990 to 1941, it remained under Italian colonial rule, and that's really the beginning of the severing, the severance of the ties with the rest of Ethiopia. Then, in 1941, when the when the Italians when the Italians were driven out of Ethiopia and as well as Eritrea, uh, then the, the issue of what to do with Eritrea became an international issue. The United Nations uh, finally resolved in view of the, the divergent sentiments. There was a very strong Unionist party, probably the strongest, the single strongest party in, in post-1940 Eritrea was the Unionist party. That's the party that advocated for unconditional union with Ethiopia. On the other hand, there were separatist parties as well. So the United Nations sent a, a commission and finally it resolved as a kind of compromise that Eritrea should be federated with Ethiopia. Uh, unfortunately, the Ethiopian government, uh, which was a really an autocratic, absolutist government, could not really accommodate even this federation and that eventually led to the starting of this Eritrean Liberation Front. Uh, and the uh, armed struggle that uh, uh, resulted in the independence of Eritrea in 1991, uh, the de facto independence in 1992. So here I have three images. But 1952, after the federation was established, we see the emperor crossing the Marab River, cutting the ribbon. You can see him with the hat, with the big hat, cutting the, the ribbon. Uh, over the over the river at the bridge over the river that separates Eritrea, still separates Eritrea with Ethiopia, and that was really a kind of symbolic gesture saying that we are now one. Then, of course, in between you have this breakup of the federation, the beginning of armed struggle, and of course in 2018 I think it will happen. And not only that, but also the war of 1998-2000. And then in 2018, the almost unthinkable happened, and uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea became once again uh, almost allies. Uh, and you see here what it meant the reunion of families, in particular the real families. I mean, you cannot imagine a much more a more passionate kiss than, than, than this one. So it all started this uh, the divergent interpretation with the counter narrative with the question of nationalities, which uh, for those who are familiar with the Marxist parlance is, is not new, of course, this is, is Lenin, Stalin, and all the others have written on this question of nationalities or national question. <coughs> in, 19, in the 1970s, or less, late 1960s and 1970s, when the Marxist students, who are the upper and the student movement, began to uh, see this, question, or to discuss this question, they really did it more or less along this Leninist and Stalinist lines. Uh, so, uh, the role of the student movement is quite, as I said, quite significant. Uh, but in the 1970s, when, when you talk of student movements, people usually 
think of uh, France, uh, Germany in the 1960s, 1968, for instance, in particular, Daniel Cohn Bendit, uh, Rudy Dushka, <laughs> uh, and so on and so forth. But in actual fact, you know, the Jacques movement was probably much more momentous than either the French or the, or the German student movement of the 60s. Uh, the one, I was in it actually, uh, that's why I'm, uh, it's not just uh, bragging, but I, I saw it. There are two student movements that were really quite powerful. It was the Italian student movement and the Iranian, the Iranian student movement. Both of them eventually culminating in revolutions, respective revolutions, 1974 in Ethiopia and 1979 in Iran. The tragedy, of course, is the students brought the revolution, but it was others who ripped the fruits of the, the soldiers in, in Ethiopia and the mullahs in, 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 uh, in Iran. So essentially, this was, the, this, this was a big issue. This was a hot issue in the 1970s. And in, that, uh, in those two fateful congresses of 1971, July in Berlin and uh, August in Los Angeles, both wings of the Tepan movement, the European and the American, uh, resolved that the issue of nationalities can only be solved by recognizing the principle of self-determination up to and including secession. So this was basically sanctified by the 1995 constitution when the APR death came to power. Well, um, I will not say that the constitution was totally useless or totally negative because it does have some positive aspects, particularly in terms of the elaboration of human rights, civic, civic liberties and so on. Even if some, some very often those uh, civic liberties are honored more by the British than by the, by the observers. But uh, it is when you come to the issues of the sections that address this question of identity, of uh, ethnicity versus nation and so on, that some of the glaring anomalies come into the forefront. I'll just give you some examples. Quite a few people have written about this as well. I have also uh, did a summary of the legacy of the student movement when it comes to the for the national audience, I mean, uh, what the legacy of the student movement is when it comes to the question of nationalities, the contradictions, the total lack of knowledge of uh, the country, the adherence only to Marxist uh, 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 rhetoric, and Marxist uh, principles, and the total ignorance of the kind of interaction and interrelationship that I had discussed in the first part of my, my lecture. Let me give you some examples. The preamble. It starts with we, the nations, nationalities, and peoples of Ethiopia, which is something completely unheard of. I don't think there is any consensus that says that. So, so the nation and the nationalities of so the ethnic groups come before the nation. Uh, if you look at any constitution, usually it says we, the people, we, the people of, like, you look at the American constitution, you look at the Nigerian constitution, the Indian constitution is always we, the people of India. Nigeria, or Nigeria. but here it says we, the nationalities and uh, nations, nationalities and peoples of Ethiopia uh, do solemnly declare this constitution and so on. And not only that, in Article 8, actually sovereignty resides in this national nations, nationalities and peoples, NNP as they are uh, said for short. Uh, and the federal government survives at the sufferance, so to say, theoretically, you know, it, 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 it gets whatever the uh, nations and nationalities could, could live for it, theoretically. Of course, in principle, actually, the federal government has not been that uh, in asserting its, uh, its rights or its uh, prerogatives. Uh, when you come to, of course, uh, the, the, most, the most contentious, the most controversial is Article 39, which has this uh, stipulation that uh, nations and nationalities have the right to self-determination, including the right to cessation. Uh, so the, that is actually sub-Article 1 of Article 39. Instead of first saying that uh, we recognize the uh, rights of nationalities and so on, cultural rights, languages, cultures and so on actually begins with assertion of the right of secession. And then of course this thing and nationalities, nations, peoples, who is who? Who is a nation? 
who is a nationality, who is a people, there is no clear definition. The only definition we have is something that's a kind of collective definition for all of them. So which actually has uh, a problem. Uh, then Article 88, which actually should have come with this Article 39, uh, which actually promotes getting coming together, that the government would promote bringing together different ethnic groups and so on. That is actually confined to the last part of the uh, of the uh, of the of the constitution. And the most tricky part, of course, is what the, the amendment clause. So you may be you may be unhappy with the constitution, but as long as you can you can amend it, there's no problem. You can amend it down the road. That is the idea. But actually, you cannot amend particular. So there is no way you can, you can amend the constitution. So I think uh, Christoph and other lawyers could help us how, how you could possibly go around because you would have said that what's the best way is to, um, to amend the amendment. In actual fact, it says this amendment clause itself cannot be uh, changed or revised or amended un until unless there is 100% consensus of all the original consensus. So sometimes you really wonder what kind of mind could have, of course, I mean, the other aspects of the constitution being uh, uh, okay, what kind of mind would conceive of this kind of uh, uh, totally uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, difficult kind of uh, situation. So this problem is accentuated by the regional constitutions themselves, which actually do not give the right of uh, residency, uh, right of residency or automatic residency in the different regions. So they, they are guests. So if you are not, if you don't belong to that ethnic group, you can any, easily be uh, expelled anytime from that from that region. So the, this, uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this, is, this is the situation. The result has been, of course, uh, uh, the, the many complex, ethnic conflicts that you have seen. Uh, of course, nowadays people talk only about the Tigrayan conflict, but there have been conflicts all over in the, in the south, between Oromo and Somali, between Oromo and Gedeo, uh, in the in the west, in the, in the west and in the south also, between uh, Amara, uh, who usually actually get the. Uh, the worst deal because they, they are regarded as settlers and people should not have been there in the, in, uh, at all in the first place. So that's why it is, it is something uh, uh, some people have called it kind of suicide pact, the constitution has been called a kind of suicide pact and uh, it was supposed to be a medicine to cure the problems of Ethiopia, the ills of Ethiopia, in actual fact it is uh, killing uh, the country. So. So this is uh, the picture that we have now, uh, uh, the result of the constitution of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, and the regions are more or less as you see them: uh, uh, Tigray in the north, uh, and comes Amhara, Afar in the in the in the east, and then all over the big Oromo loop, but the central part, and the Somali region in the south, in the southeast rather. By way of contrast, I have also put here the 1974, the pre-1974 map, which is actually based on regional, on the basis of regions rather than ethnic, ethnic groups. So, as for the synthesis, you know, of course, there are some measures taken to remedy this kind of uh, bias or this kind of uh, narrative that is biased towards ethnic groups rather than the nation. Um, you know, there is always this rhetoric of unity in the diversity, and there is a kind of attempt to resuscitate the value of the flag, although what kind of flag is itself also contested. 
because there is a popular flag which has no emblem and then there is a government flag which has got this emblem in the middle for the nationalities. Uh, there are also, I mean, by, by the, on the public, at the public, the Ethiopian millennium also is another, another example. The, the millennium was, the, the, was uh, the Ethiopian millennium was in 2007, we are seven years behind. Uh, and the government tried to bring out this idea of national unity, national consensus through the observation of the millennium. Uh, in fact, the, the Renaissance dam, you know, is essentially gets its name from that uh, from that holiday. There are also some popular reactions to this ethnic uh, division through syncretic songs, you know, like using uh, Oromo tune and uh, with Amharic lyric or Tigrayan lyric with Oromo with Amharic uh, tune and so on and so forth. Uh, but these are uh, really uh, the kind of palliatives, if you wish. Uh, well, the coming of Abi represented really a new departure because he emphasized the idea of pan Ethiopianism, but the Ethiopian nation of it. So, in the famous inaugural speech that he gave in, in April 2018, in that one hour and half speech, I think people have been counting, he mentioned Ethiopia maybe 30 times or more, and people are contrasting with Manas. Who, who did not uh, say Ethiopia as much as many times in his 20 years uh, in, in power. So there are others, other attempts also to, uh, there are other measures that were taken to emphasize this Ethiopian identity. Two commissions were actually established, one was the Peace and Reconciliation Commission, the other was the Identity and Boundary Commission, because really to address this whole question of ethnic conflict that had arisen after, <coughs> after uh, 19, uh, after 1995. Uh, but he has had his problems in terms of uh, being accepted. Oromo, not all of Oromo accept him. He is actually he himself is a really typical hybrid Ethiopian. Oromo father, Amara mother, Oro, uh, Muslim father, Orthodox Christian mother, and he also himself Pentecostal inclined uh, Protestant. So he is a perfect uh, hybrid, so to say. But with, among the Oromo, partly because of this. He is not regarded as really serving the Oromo interest, and uh, he is sometimes dubbed even kind of Neftanya, which is a pejorative term used for Amara settlers. So the, uh, his, there is resistance within the Oromo, and of course the confrontation with the TPLF, which is now dominated the, the, the news media uh, uh, from standoff, something like two years of standoff, and then finally uh, culminating in war. Uh, which has been totally misled by by the Western reaction. Uh, but on the other hand, the way the, the West reacted to this, the way the, the West, particularly the American administration, more or less kind of uh, put, its, uh, put itself on the side of the TPLF and has been pressurizing the, the government to make concessions of, uh, has actually tended to reinforce this kind of pan European identity the kind of resistance to external intrusion that uh, we discussed earlier. So essentially to conclude, uh, the revision of the 1995 constitution has become more and more imperative. There is no there is no way you can get out of this impasse until and unless you actually do, uh, revise the constitution. Of course, it requires quite a highly sophisticated panel of lawyers to how to come around all the all the bottlenecks, all the hurdles of the of the amendment clause. Uh, the that the federal arrangement has to be there is an inescapable thing. I mean, Ethiopia is so diverse. There is no way you can go back to the unitary system of the imperial period, or that that period it has to be federal. There is consensus, total consensus. But what kind of federalism? On what basis do you have this federal arrangement? That's really the question. So uh, I think I mean the, the Nigerian experience to some extent is instructive because. They have gone for this really diffusing of ethnic uh, uh, identity in the drawing of the regional or the state boundaries of the state nomenclature. So something might be learned from there. Or you can go the, the really harsh way, like uh, like Makagami did, totally abolishing ID cards. You know? <laughs> no, no, no ID cards. Although now, of course, I think that's also being considered in Ethiopia. So essentially, the, 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 the direction or the, the objective should be to privilege pan-Ethiopian identity 
while of course doing while accommodating ethno nationalist identity you can you cannot ignore uh, what how much how far can you go that's of course something that happened the plan there's a national dialogue that's planned for the next i don't know month or so and these are things that have to be addressed i'm sure they will be addressed uh, because without addressing these issues you can't go uh, any far at the same time, however, I think what Ethiopia needs is a promotion of democratic institutions. If there was democratic democracy, if there was pluralism, I think this emphasis on ethnic identity or ethnic rights would, have, would not have assumed the kind of absolute uh, absolutism that it has, it, has, it has attained. And at the end of the day, of course, I dreamed in my first thing, my, my, my paper in 2005, that the solution is even planning. Northeast Africa Confederation. That's a dream, I know, but, but I would dare to dream for that because I don't think there is another solution to this uh, uh, almost cancerous uh, problem that we have had in the future. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Barker. That was uh, expansive and immersive and, and fascinating. Uh, we have uh, approximately 20, 25 minutes time for, for some Q&A. Uh, so uh, we'll do this as in, in the past. First of all, let me, uh, from my side, also welcome our large online audience. It's wonderful to see so many names of uh, Stia's fellows from recent cohorts and also from, from some very oh, early cohorts. Uh, welcome and, and thank you so much for joining us. Also to add all the other participants uh, and I'm sure some students of, uh, of Professor Zodi. Uh, it's a pleasure to have everyone uh, with us. Uh, as in the past, we'll take some questions from the audience in the room and some questions from those online. Perhaps just to make a remark, we cannot uh, follow the conversations on the Q&A uh, in real time so well. You're welcome to post any comments and uh, remarks there. It will be something that, that we can pick up and refer to afterwards, uh, but we won't be able to respond to those in this session. So what we'd like to ask is that you use the raise hand function of MS Teams. Uh, we'll do this kind of, let's say, take two questions or so from the physical audience here and then take two questions or so from the online audience in turn until our time runs out. So it's a matter of first come, first to speak, or first hand up, first to, to address us. So without any ado, let me start with uh, uh, an invitation to our uh, audience in the room here uh, for any comments and questions, which we pray you keep brief and to the point, please. We have uh, Perhanu. Thank you. Well, first is to perhaps extend a message of huge appreciation and congratulations for for the for getting the subject here for us. Then I have just two or three just comments. Why did you say vexing issue? <laughs> perhaps just a, well, just from your point of view, I'm vexed, but I just want to know. Uh, how you feel about that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, I think as a, well, uh, in, in chemistry, when we work with natural products, you extract them, get a tarry material, you want to get some crystals out of it. If, if you fail, uh, you can report them and say this is intractable. Mm -hmm. So it seems mm -hmm. like this, this problem of the hip is maybe in a way intractable. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I, I believe that the EPRDF had a lot to do with it, with, with getting us where we are. Uh, a little comment on that, please. Maybe I'll read it later, but thank, thank you very much. Thanks, very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. 
If there aren't any immediate further questions here, we'll take two, the first two hands up uh, from online. So this is Ezana Welde Gabriel uh, first, and then second, someone who I can only identify by the number 12824656080. Please, please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for giving me this chance. I am really deeply uh, troubled and really shocked that the professor, which I used to respect, uh, said that, you know, the, the West didn't get what's going on in Ethiopia wrong and Abi is building a Pan-African uh, narrative. Uh, I mean, people are dying, you know, not only Tigrans are dying, but also, you know, Amharas, Afaris are dying, and that's because not because Abi is trying to build a pan-Ethiopian identity or uh, nationalism, because he is enforcing or is promoting a revanchist uh, nationalism, you know, that suppresses, you know, regional autonomy. The Ethiopia, the crux of the Ethiopian problem is there is this centralizing center and regions want autonomy, you know, narrated by nationalism. And in the presentation, that what I found very problematic and irksome is that he romanticizes the past as, you know, like as there was an attempt to build a pan Ethiopianism. That's a lie. I mean, let, let's not, you know, give a wrong idea that, you know, what was the, 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 the project of nation building in Ethiopia, particularly during Haile Selassie, was more of Amharanizing. People were made to their culture, to ignore their language, and to adopt, you know, Orthodox Christianity. Me, myself, being as a Tigran, I've been growing up being, you know, insulted because of my, my uh, ethnicity. The last point I want to make is that, you know, the, 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 the professor suggested changing the, the federalism into another arrangement, into geography and so on. I respect as that you know, as his personal political position, that's fine. But a recent survey by African Barometer showed that more than 50% of Ethiopians support, uh, support the Constitution, including Article 39, the right to cessation. And for an, a critical observer of the Ethiopian politics, there are so many political groups which want the Constitution to, me, to maintain. So, you know, this is, I mean, I want to make a final comment for the organizers. I respect, you know, the political standing of the professor. I respect him for his work. But when you invite, I mean, at, at, at this point, a genocide has, is, is being conducted on Tigran. Many Tigrans have been killed. A weapon, you know, people are in famine. More than 400,000, this is the UN uh, figure are dying of famine. So when you invite people about Ethiopian issues, you should have to bring one, you know, which can tell you the state narrative, just like Professor Baharu did, and another one from those people who want more of regional autonomy, <coughs> national pride. Because Ethiopianism is also ethno-nationalism, which is draped in uh, you know, uh, in, in the bigger Ethiopia uh, dis discourse or narrative, ethno-nationalism is also ethno-nationalism, and both are imagined communities. So uh, this, is, this is what I want to make to the professor as well as the organizers. Thank you for the chance. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thanks very much with appreciation. We please ask that the questions be kept very brief. Uh, there's a third question uh, I had identified as one, two, eight, etc. Please go ahead. Uh, perhaps we'll go okay. to the, to the uh, perhaps you'll respond. Yeah, let me uh, respond to this. Thank you. Uh, Brano's uh, question, it's, not, it's more a comment actually, it's kind of elaboration to some extent. Uh, vexing, I thought, I thought uh, you know, it's quite obvious from the, from, my, from the lecture that it is a vexing question. Vexing in the sense that it's really 
It's not intractable, it would be a bit, a bit uh, too pessimistic. It means it can never be solved. So uh, when you say vexing, on the other hand, you would say that it is, it is difficult, but not insoluble. So that's why I chose, I chose, I chose vexing, because it does. There is a lot of contention. Uh, there is a lot of contestation about identity in Ethiopia, the na national identity and uh, uh, ethnic identity. So how do you resolve it is, is a problem. So uh, as to the role of the EPRDF, I mean, it's very clear. This was an EPRDF uh, constitution. Although it has its roots in the student movement, it was the EPRDF which actually finally enshrined it in the, in the 1995 constitution. So it's quite clear that uh, for one reason or another, they wanted the constitution to be crafted in this way. Um, with regard to the second uh, Mr. Ezana's uh, intervention, I mean, I mean, it's of course, I mean, uh, he wants me to, he wants to drag me into this current uh, uh, <laughs> debate, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, the pan-Ethiopianism at least Rhetorically, at least, pan-Ethiopianism has been the agenda of Abi. Uh, the current situation has nothing to do with, with the pan-Ethiopian agenda. It has to do with the way the TPL, TPLF responded to the initiative that was taken by, by Abi and the, the reluctance to accept uh, the kind of uh, measures that he was taking. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, if you, as you know, there was quite, quite a lot of initiatives taken to bring the two sides together, to bring them closer, and finally avoid the kind of uh, uh, destructions that we are, having, we are having now. The TPLF refused to negotiate with, with Abi. Uh, so as, as far as this ethno-nationalist and so on and so forth, I have, I have explained quite clearly in the, in the narrative that there is a legitimate uh, cause for the rise of ethno-nationalism, for the rise of, because of the oppression, because of the assimilation, uh, because of the marginalization and so on. So I've said that if you had heard me correctly. So uh, the, the thing is whether it should have been pushed to this extent, the extent of really more or less negating the pan-Ethiopian identity that has been there for so long. So uh, I am not romanticizing. I'm not romanticizing. I've tried to, to give both sides of the picture, both the, the Ethiopian picture, the thesis and the antithesis. The antithesis also has its own uh, legitimate uh, roots understandable roots and causes. Thank you. Let's have so, another uh, response from the room. We have enough interest <laughs> from the online audience, so we can go to the next person, Hibis Kassa, please. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to en engage with Professor Zode. It's really an exceptional opportunity to engage with an historian uh, because there are particular insights that historians can give us in this in this uh, uh, period of deep polarization in Ethiopia, as was illustrated by one of the speakers from the floor. Um, I must say that as an intellectual myself, I've also come under attack when taking particular positions and therefore there's a need for also encouraging, uh, creating a space that's also safe for all intellectuals to also engage and present their arguments freely. And therefore I, want, I just want to express my solidarity uh, with Professor Zode uh, due to the kind of hostilities that he has uh, faced uh, today. But my question immediately has to do with um, uh, the, the thing about ethnicity and trying to understand it in terms of how it's constituted, because there's a, uh, the reproduction of ethnicity on the basis of uh, family and uh, or blood relations and that uh, which arises out of socialization. Feminists in Ethiopia have raised these questions about the, 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 the ways in which motherhood and maternal lineage is not also taken into cognizance. So uh, engaging with the ethno-nationalist assumptions on their own terms and critiquing it. And I think that's necessary to also reflect on that and uh, the extent to which even the uh, ethnic identities are, uh, are also very rigid. And I really want to get the, an understanding from Professor Zode, um, the extent to which the colonial construct in the specific case of Ethiopia by the Italians in particular had bearing on shaping the nature of what we understand today as ethnicities that we're holding onto as rigid categories. And if the, the ways that people thought of it in the past may have been more fluid, 
So whether there were more language groups uh, historically constituted. I've heard some very problematic framings of ethnicity that, for instance, conflate class and ethnic uh, uh, identities. So for instance, looking at the, the, the particular groupings in uh, and looking at it from a period of history and assuming that particular groupings um, would be, uh, for instance, presumed to be um, uh, uh, necessarily workers. Uh, so the, looking at them as uh, w oppressed groups, basically, while others are elites. So the, it creates a problem not just for, hi for, for historical analysis, but even in terms of uh, trying to understand economic processes. How can we understand the way inequalities are reproduced if we can't understand these ethnicities and class relationships as necessarily being complicated? So when we have an oversimplistic view of things, we assume all particular ethnic groups as elites, as uh, oppressors, as dominant groups. We can't understand the way inequalities are reproduced and the way people relate with each other in everyday life uh, and therefore it becomes a possibility for certain ethnic groups to be to genocide to occur this is a very real thing that was stated earlier uh, so for instance if you look at the Makaidra massacre uh, that occurred in western Tigray migrant workers from particular ethnic groups were slaughtered for simply being present in a space and working as migrant workers. And we can liken that to the kind of uh, brutal attacks that uh, that uh, groups uh, like uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria have also unleashed on migrant farmers, uh, farmers were also slaughtered in the course of doing their everyday uh, uh, survival uh, and engaged in livelihood activities. And therefore there's something that I think we need to understand much more deeply about this. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Shall, shall we take one more or would you like to respond? Yeah, let me respond to this. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. I think this is a very constructive intervention. Uh, I, I think the basis of ethnic identification essentially has to do most, mostly with language uh, in the Ethiopian, in the Ethiopian, case, in the Ethiopian setting. From the time it started to emerge in the 1960s, uh, more than more than blood relations or, or anything of that kind. So essentially, it's on the basis of language that most of the, not only the ethnic organizations have been, ethno-national organizations have been built, but also the the federal regions were constituted also along the on the basis of language. You know, uh, uh, except for the southern nations and nationalities, which is actually a collection of different uh, nationalities. Uh, with the colonial, colonial intervention, as I said, was not decisive because it was short-lived. But it's very interesting when the Italians did have some time in, in 1936-41, they reconfigured the, the whole East African region, the whole East African possessions, because by this time, when they occupied Ethiopia, which was really the jewels that they were after all the while, while they were occupying Eritrea and uh, Somalia, once they have occupied Ethiopia, what they did was to create a large entity called uh, African East Africa, um, Italian East Africa, Africa Oriental Italiana. Uh, and they divided it in a completely different way from the way it was before or even later on. So uh, this is the first time actually we have the kind of ethnic, ethnic regionalization of the country. We have the Amara region. You have the Somali region, the Somali part, the Ethiopian Somalis being merged in with the Italian Somaliland. And then you have Eritrea, including Tigray, because they are like, speaking the same language. So you have Eritrea uh, and, and uh, kind of greater Tigray or greater Eritrea. Uh, the only thing, of course, for the Oromo, they could not have one uh, entity. Instead, they merges them with what they call the Sidama, like the Southern peoples today. So they have this kind of thing. So it's only then that you have this kind of uh, experiment in ethnic ethnic uh, configuration of, of the country. Uh, otherwise, really, uh, as I said, you know, the, the ethnic, ethnic uh, uh, identification essentially is a, a, a development of the 1960s at the, at the most, you know, the 1960s and thereafter, of course, it picked up momentum after 1974-75. Thank you. We'll come to uh, Christoph and then we'll go to the next uh, hand up online. Christoph, please. Just as far as constructive comments are concerned. Yeah. Um, and, and you sort of uh, 
addressed the constitutions. Yeah. Uh, you may be interested to know that the German uh, basic law, the German Grundgesetz, yeah. in Article 79, uh, Paragraph 3, contains what we call an eternity clause, meaning mm -hmm. that the principles enshrined in Article 1, which is basically the dignity of, uh, of man, and in Article 20, Germany being a democracy and also being a federation, which in our context is relevant, mm -hmm. may not be changed. Okay. So even a, even a consensus could not change that. I mean, how much that is worth, if there is a consensus, is a different question. But that's at least, I mean, obviously this was, was created after the trauma of Nazism. So mm -hmm. one tried to make this resilient against any efforts to change that, to centralize the country as the Nazis did, and to attack frontally, sort of attack the dignity of man. So eternity okay. clause is an, and could also send a powerful message to uh, ethnicities in the country. This is a basic structure that we will not change. Okay, thank you. Uh, <coughs> we have uh, in your Loa again, Ogunseye. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished Emeritus Professor. Thank you for your presentation. It's very illuminating. Uh, I'm particularly going to take a different perspective from most uh, speakers who have either commented or asked a question. Now, of particular highlight is your that uh, point where you talk about the culinary uh, advantage that uh, food itself presents and has been able to unify the various ethnic identities within uh, the Ethiopian society, which I see as a front. So my question is this, how can culinary uh, assemblies become a front, become a powerful tool to forestall further devastating humanitarian crisis? and be a uniting front to end this uh, carnage, this serious uh, 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 brutalization and destruction of lives and property in Ethiopia. Thank you. I'm talking from Ajayi Crowder University, Nigeria. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> May we take one more? Yeah, please. Uh, please, Eli Kurana. Thank you, Prof, for a very uh, nice uh, lecture. I have a slight uh, question uh, relating to identity based on livelihoods. What's your comment if uh, communities would identify themselves based on their livelihoods, like uh, crop growers uh, or pastoralists, uh, who are many in, in Ethiopia? Would that, would that uh, polarize or really try to unify uh, the nation? What is your comment on that? <laughs> Can I respond? You're welcome to respond. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> I think you have taken this culinary thing too seriously, my, my friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or say, or <laughs> I, mean, I didn't. Uh, I didn't present it as a recipe or as a panacea for Ethiopia's <laughs> ethnic <laughs> ethnic problems. I'm just trying to reinforce the idea of how you know ethnic uh, these kind of things were went across ethnic boundaries, like like a, a, a food item or a, a kind of a food that was unique to a certain ethnic group eventually became a national food. Uh, that's that's what I, what I was striving at. I was not saying that it's a, a solution to Ethiopia's uh, problems of identity. <laughs> uh, but, you know, identity is multiple, you know? You know I have dealt only with one aspect, which is a, really the a political uh, identity. But otherwise, you know, we, we do have in Ethiopia quite people People who are pastoralists in particular, who have their own identity, different kind of uh, occupational uh, concerns and so on. So obviously there is there is that kind of identity as well, but it, it has, because it has not really uh, assumed this kind of, uh, what you may call prime importance, primary importance in, in the solution of Ethiopia's problems, I have not really touched on it. Thank you. We'll have... Uh... The next um, uh, question online is from uh, uh, Isu. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for the chance. Uh, uh, the, thank you for the presentation, Professor. 
um, uh, so my my question is on ethnic identity. Uh, in, on some part of your presentation, uh, I believe you mentioned that this ethnic identity is more or less uh, 60 to 70 years old, which which I believe is not uh, accurate uh, because uh, ethnic identity has always been there. Ethiopia has always been a country of nations and nationalities and all these identities have been struggling, uh, fighting uh, for, 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 for their rights for a very long time, even before the assimilation campaign and afterwards. So uh, don't you think that would be uh, a bit of a problem to describe it in such a way? And if you consider, for example, uh, the, the, the domination uh, that you mentioned in the part of your presentation, you mentioned that even though uh, in, in terms of policy, it was like ethnic um, uh, self-rule, but that was not really respected because there was a lot of domination. So wouldn't that wouldn't the scientific conclusion uh, be uh, in a point where that should be implemented instead of uh, assuming that the ethnic, uh, uh, I mean, the ethnic uh, uh, political uh, arrangement has failed? I don't think it has failed because it has never been implemented and anyone with uh, with some knowledge of the Ethiopian case would actually argue that uh, self-rule was not respected at any time, even uh, in the last three decades, because uh, the, 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 the self-rule was not there and also the shared rule was not there. So these are the two uh, primary standings of federalism. And if that federalism was not really implemented, wouldn't it be scientific to to actually argue that it should be implemented, just like democracy, for example. Even though Ethiopia was called a democratic state in the last 30 years, democracy, we all know that democracy has never been implemented. Would it be right for someone to claim that democracy has failed in Ethiopia and we should be looking at other options based on the, uh, the, the failure of the application itself? And why would we think that uh, a proper, um, uh, a proper uh, arrangement where identity at the same time ethnic identity is also given self-rule with the shared rule that should be respected in a model like that that would surely work and why would we assume uh, that it failed because that's not really scientific in in, in my opinion thank you okay thank you Isu. and then uh, also elizabeth olsen yes alwood i'm not sure which which one of you please go ahead Yep. Yeah, it's uh, Jens Orbud here. Yeah, I'm asking this question from Sweden, so you're heard all over the planet. OK, <laughs> I, I'm interested in two questions uh, regarding the background in Ethiopia, and then I have another question aimed at the future. The first one is, is religion a unifying or diversifying factor in, your, in Ethiopia? I don't know enough about Ethiopia, but my impression is that Orthodox Christianity is the dominant. But I don't know if if religion can also play a role in uh, dividing the country. So that's the first question. The second question is language, which you have already touched on. Uh, has have there been attempts in Ethiopia to create a lingua franca of some sort? I mean, some countries in the world are uh, Indonesia to take one. You have a lot of different languages, but they have managed to make Bahasa Indonesia a, a unifying factor. Other countries like South Africa rely on English <laughs> or something like that. OK, so I don't know. This would be interesting to hear you say something. About that. OK. Uh, third, fact, third question is, there are many countries in Africa which have ethnic diversity and uh, in some of the countries um, I think uh, factors are worse than in Ethiopia but in they like Nigeria for example where religion is a very uh, important factor in splitting the country um, but it's still not um, come down to as much civil war perhaps well I guess right now it's looking not so good in Nigeria either but is there any positive role model in Africa that you could uh, point to that uh, Ethiopia might learn something from? 
Thank you, again. Thank you for those questions. Uh, before I ask um, Bachrut to respond, I think those would have been the, the final interventions that we can uh, afford in terms of time. Mm -hmm. So the rest of you who have your, have your hands up, please do enter your questions or comments into the, uh, the chat box. We will be able to pick that up and, uh, and, and hand that to Professor Bachrut for perhaps further follow-up. Uh, please, Bachrut, you can go ahead. Yeah. Well, the issue tells us that ethnic uh, divisions or ethnic uh, identity uh, has, had pre-existed, had been there before before the 1960s and so on. I mean, I I tried as much as possible to explain what kind of identity there was before. If you, if you had some evidence, I wish he had, he had shown us, he has given us some examples. So uh, I think it's essentially after the 1960s in particular that people begin to think and organize themselves along along ethnic lines. Uh, and I was not against the federal arrangement that, as such. You know, the federal arrangement, I think I said, is there is general consensus that Ethiopia has to be a federal uh, structure. It has to have a federal structure, but essentially on what basis? Whether it should be ethnic or some other uh, uh, system that might combine some element of the ethnic, but it doesn't have to be exclusively, exclusively ethnic. This is essentially the argument that I did. And uh, did I hear something that democracy doesn't work, something like that? Well, I mean, if you can, if you can give us a better formula, uh, we we'll be, would be prepared to listen. But essentially, that's the only way you can actually solve most of the problems that we have in, in Ethiopia. The problem is that the emphasis was too much on uh, group rights, uh, group identity, rather than really uh, observance of the civic rights. The constitution has very, very uh, laudable clauses about the observance of civil liberties and so on, about the respect for civil liberties. The problem is that it was not observed, it was not implemented. So what we need is really more implementation of that kind of thing. So there is no other way that you can actually try to accommodate all the divergent feelings and aspirations. Uh, Professor, I think you might have misunderstood my question on the democracy. I, I was not claiming democracy is not working. So I was not claiming yeah. democracy did not work. I was just saying, what if a person came and claimed that democracy did not work in Ethiopia for the last 30 years, uh, so we should change it? That would be highly logical. The same logic goes for the ethnic arrangement, which was not even implemented because there was a lot of domination from the side of TPLF, and it has never been implemented. Wouldn't it be scientific to claim that we should imp apply it instead of... Uh, what, is, what is the alternative? What alternative would you think of, would you conceive of? outside democracy? No, sir, I, I think you, you have misunderstood my question. I'm not claiming there should be another system for democracy. I'm just using that analogy to claim, just like yeah, we cannot, argue democracy yeah. has not worked in Ethiopia, we yeah. cannot also claim that ethnic politics has not worked in Ethiopia because it has never been implemented because uh, the, I, ethnic, uh, even though it, <laughs> in reality the law was there, it was never implemented. I, you and I uh, all know that it was only TPLF who had all the political power and the ethnic uh, were not really uh, implemented. So it, shouldn't it be scientific to claim that it should be correctly implemented just like democracy instead of arguing against it? Because we all know like the problems that we had were ethnic based. And to come up with the uh, with the federalism that is, okay. Okay. Ethnic, okay. Okay. is not just a minute. Up. I, th I think let me respond to that. You know, uh, the problem with the ethnic arrangement is not only that the, the TPLF had a dominant position, hegemonic position, and did not allow it to be exercised, but it has also contributed to ethnic clashes, ethnic uh, dislocation, uh, uh, people being driven out of their, uh, their, their the provinces where they have been for for many years and so on. So there is that dimension also. It's not only that it has not been implemented for some of the, 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 the groups, but essentially that it had not led to the kind of harmonious relationship or the, between the different different peoples, different ethnic groups that it was supposed to have. So that, that's that's my, my my problem with this. With the role of religion, I think to come to the last question. The, the role of religion so far, I mean, I, I mean, of course, we have had in the past some clashes between the different uh, religions, particularly between the Christians and uh, the Muslims. Probably the most important, the most serious was in the 16th century when we had this 
big wars of uh, Ahmed Grani as he's called, the left-handed. Uh, but since then, I don't think there has been any serious clash of religions, fortunately, for us, because, I mean, with all our problems, if you add religion, then it will be quite, uh, quite explosive. Uh, in fact, there are some very good examples of mutual uh, tolerance, uh, peaceful coexistence. Uh, again, Wollo, Wollo is a very good example where Muslims and Christians live harmoniously together, where they celebrate each other's holidays, uh, where the Muslims actually uh, go out of their way to protect and also celebrate the Christian, uh, Christian holy shrines and so on. So uh, we haven't see, had any serious problem so far, at least. Uh, of course, there is some kind of, you know, exchanges between the different groups. You might say to some extent there is more tension between Orthodox Christians and Pentecostal Christians than between, uh, between, uh, between Muslims and Christians. Uh, lingua franca, there is in effect a kind of lingua franca, which is Amharic. Amharic is, by, 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 to some extent, by government uh, support, but also really organically as it developed, especially in the, in the urban setting, it is a lingua franca. Uh, and of course, it has been also recognized as the first official language, now it is called the working language. But now there is a, a tendency to really try to broaden it a bit further. Uh, and really recognize not only Amharic, but also five other languages or four other languages as also national languages. This is Oromo, uh, Oromo, Oromifa, uh, Tigrinya, uh, Afar, and Sidama, which is southern, not the south, Sidama. So there is this kind of broadening, but essentially, if you're talking about lingua franca, Amharic is a lingua franca of Ethiopia. Okay, so thank you very, very much uh, for uh, that wonderful lecture. Thank you for all the inputs that we've received online and from the audience here. Uh, before, we, before we give a final round of applause, um, let me, in support of, I think it was in your Lua, speak about food. So, Professor Zudi, you will know at Stias, we place great emphasis on our daily meals. Those of you who, are, who have been here will know. And we have the pleasure of, of inviting those who are in the room to go and share a glass uh, and something to eat together, because in fact, we think food is an important bringing together. <laughs> so, um, so with that, let's so, give yeah, up. Maybe let's... you should also uh, enlighten this uh, guy, Isra, somebody who said that you should have invited somebody else. <laughs> right. <laughs> to, to, to come.